On this episode we find out how solicitor fees are calculated, how to get into property law and what's involved in marketing a law firm and much more. I'm David Garbert and now it's time to spend 30 minutes in finance. But first a quick disclaimer. This podcast and the information in it is not legal or financial advice and it's intended as general information only and should not be relied upon. For advice, please contact our guest directly. Hi, I'm uh, Ed Zanoima. I'm a, uh, uh, an associate at uh, Seddon's um, Solicitors in the West End of London. Um, I specialise in uh, secured lending. Um, also known as real estate finance. So uh, my role involves advising lenders, uh, banks, um, et cetera, very much on bridging and short-term uh, lending deals. Perfect. And uh, thanks for coming on, Ed. Um, for Pleasure. everyone listening, can you kind of give us a, a sort of brief rundown on what a convincing solicitor's role looks like and, and what a day-to-day for you sort of is sure um what 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 i would say uh david on that point is that um you know i wouldn't classify myself actually as a conveyancing solicitor obviously we're we're involved in uh supporting uh you know banks and lenders uh through the the uh, conveyancing process but um you know very much um our focus is uh acting for the bank and the lender um but to sort of answer your question um, what we do and what, in fact, a conveyancing solicitor does is, um, you know, assists with the process um, acting for a buyer or a seller, if you are, in fact, a conveyancing solicitor, um, either side of uh, the, the the process and the deal um, on on the uh, the transfer of um, property or the refinance of a property um, uh, and so on. But, um, you know, given that I'm only acting for uh, for lenders um, myself, um, you know, I'm less involved on the the sales side of the process, um, and also I would also add that my role um, traditionally involves um, you know advising on a mixed range of uh, use of properties. Um, so whereas a conveyancer may typically be classified as um, advising only on uh, residential properties, um, in secured lending as a real estate finance solicitor. Um, you know, I advise lenders and banks in respect of um, both commercial and residential properties, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And uh, I've actually learned something there. So apologies if I've ever called you a convincing solicitor. Uh, oh, don't worry, <laughs> in I, the I've past. been called worse. Carry on. <laughs> no, yeah. So in terms of obviously your day to day, then um, what does that sort of typically look like? A, um, well, it, well, it it, re- it really depends, David. I mean, at any given time, the uh, the day to day, you know, can vary. You, you, we we are involved in you know a very fast paced um, industry and and service in terms of the advice and uh, the service that we provide to our clients. So, um, you know, whereas some days we may um, have time to look at any given uh, property or deal. Um, and be reporting on it um, and, and spending our time going through papers and documents, et cetera. You know, on another day, we may be urgently um, working on, you know, a completion which is due to happen um, on that day. And there are also, you know, various points that come up all the time because this is, you know, um, bridging often uh, and, and very fast paced deals that we're looking at. Um, so, you know, um, it, it really does vary. And, and, you know, I wouldn't say there's a typical day. Um, you know, I'd like to say that, um, you know, there's a typical week and throughout the course of a week, yeah, my role would involve taking on and looking at, um, you know, a new property, a new instruction from a lender, going through, um, you know, the the papers relating to that property. Um, our role is very much one where we facilitate and liaise with the borrower's solicitor. Um, you know, there's then all the parts of that dealing with, um, you know, the documents that go along with that. Um, typically loan agreements, legal charges, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes the day will be taken up by uh, firefighting on a particular point or urgently assisting our lender client to try and get a deal over the line um, if it's due to complete on that particular day. So um, there's quite a variety um, and it's a very fast paced uh, end of the business that we're involved in is, is basically a synopsis of what I would say. Uh, brilliant. And do you, is it only lenders that you work with or do you have any direct clients that are sort of purchasing things or anything like that? Um, well, yeah, the, 
personally um, and within the real estate finance team at Seddon's, um, we are only acting for for the lender. I mean, our firm is very capable and has other people in other property departments in the wider property department that acts for um, you know the buyer or the seller of a property. Um, but in real estate finance, my role is exclusively advising um, lenders. Yeah, on the on the terms or the security that they're taking. Okay, perfect. And let's sort of wind the clock back a little bit in terms of um, how you actually get into the the industry. Like, did you wake up one day and say, "Okay, I want to be a real estate um, property solicitor," <laughs> um, or how do? What's the sort of process into getting into to what you do? Yeah, well, our uh... I think um, you know the 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 answer to that is it varies from person to person, and I know the the question is is aimed at myself, so I will just give you a very brief background on that because my background's slightly uh, uh, slightly different. So you know, um, I I trained as a lawyer, having had a previous career um, in uh, recruitment. So I trained as a lawyer relatively late. Um, and, uh, you know, the the answer to your question is that uh, certainly my experience, you, it's 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 not often uh, the case that you go into law and say, you know, I, I want to do X or Y. I mean, some people do. Um, my my own personal experience was, you know, I trained as a lawyer um, I was in a firm at the time um, with a focus on property. Um, I qualified and started work um, once once qualified as a conveyancer, funnily enough, um, advising uh, in the main on residential property, but actually also doing some uh, commercial property as well. Um, I then, uh, you know, morphed into um, a real estate finance specialist, um, which I have to say, I think um, was something that I, I wanted to do. And I saw that it was available at a particular firm that I was at um, at the time, um, I then joined Seddon's, um, you know, specifically within the real estate finance team, um, and now that's uh, that's what I do. So you know, I think it varies from person to person, um, but from my perspective, uh, you know, that's how I ended up. Um, so I qualified, as I say, uh, was a property solicitor to begin with. Um, but then saw an opportunity to focus in real estate finance. And to be honest with you, you know, um, given my previous experience, my previous career in uh, in recruitment, um, very fast paced sort of deal driven environment, um, I have found that, uh, you know, and uh, I think I specifically targeted wanting to work in this this area of uh, of property law, if you like, because, um, you know, it is fast paced. It is exciting and there is variety, um, you know, and, and it's and it's uh, it's um, you know very commercial, which, which, which suits me, I think. Yeah, it's really interesting, obviously, changing career like that. Can Are you happy to share sort of what caused the, the changes and why did you uh, want to sort of swap careers? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I would say yeah, in, in very broad terms, um, I kind of fell out of love uh with uh with recruitment um i did it for 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 quite a long time um and i kind of reached a point where i decided that you know i wanted to do something a little bit more challenging um where i could take my commercial skills and experience um into a more sort of professional arena um not to not to say that recruitment isn't but um, you know, I'd done it for quite a long time and I wanted to do something different. I'd always had an eye on the fact that I, you know, perhaps should and could have been a lawyer um, when I first went to university. But for a variety of reasons, that wasn't the path that I chose to go down. So I was looking to think, you know, what I could do next. Um, yeah, there is a lot more background and detail to it. And it wasn't an easy decision to make. And it's a big commitment, obviously, to uh, train as a solicitor Um later on in life as I did um but you know long story short um you know that's what I did and I'm pleased that I did it um and uh yeah I I I wanted um to bring to bear you know as I say my commercial experience my contacts and my networks into a profession where I thought that that would be useful as well and you know to be frank working for um a firm like Seddon's in the West End a very entrepreneurial driven firm like Seddon's um it, you know 
makes makes use of that which you know i'm, I'm delighted about yeah because it's quite a brave step i think i was talking to um we had a another broker on a little while ago that sort of left the bank and went on his own and i always find it quite you know inspiring when people do take a, a bit of a leap into something different um and yours is a, a serious leap it's not even a like a step in a, a different direction um when obviously with the fast paced sort of business that you were talking about is that mainly uh, are most of the lenders that you work for like us bridging lenders or is there a, a bit of a mix no there is a mix um yeah I, I, yeah the one, one yes absolutely i i maybe uh, haven't gone into that so you know we we also advise um other lenders um including yourselves occasionally you know on um uh, I guess, for one of a better description, uh, development deals, um, which typically are um, slower paced. Um, and also, you know, I guess in between that, what we would term as maybe structured finance deals or, you know, refurbishment deals. So, um, yeah, the, 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 you know, the deals that we advise on, you know, aren't always, uh, you know, um, looking to complete yesterday. Um, sometimes there's a, you know, a longer a longer time frame and build up and uh you know um a more in-depth uh requirement um you know because at the end of the day you know typically development deals do have more uh to them in terms of the advice and the complexity so um it's not only bridging bridging and development i would say um and uh you know refurbishment in between do you have a, a favorite type of deal that you like doing or are they all your sort of babies um and any that i'm acting uh on on your behalf in david um, <laughs> the, the, well the, obviously the is, no, I, I i i personally i i um, i enjoy the variety and and i think it's good to have a a mixed um a mixed caseload um and you know we we do i mean i do typically um at any given time i'll have a real mix from um you know from deals that are, um, uh, you know, uh, having to complete yesterday, almost, almost literally, as we may come on to in, in, in later on in the, in the conversation, I'm sure, um, yeah. to ones that, you know, and, and they may have, you know, um, a lot of indemnity insurance behind them to to facilitate that, um, you know, I'm talking, you know, searches, et cetera, et cetera, being covered by indemnities to save time, um, uh, you know, versus, as I say, uh, longer, slower burning deals which are um you know requiring um you know sometimes uh input of our um colleagues in in our construction departments or planning etc cetera, etc cetera. so no there's a real mix and um and and at any given time you know i'd like to think that my caseload you know reflects the the range of uh, deals and lenders that we advise Brilliant. When I mentioned to a couple of people that you were coming on um uh, there was one question that popped up quite often and it as no surprise revolves around the money side of things um and as a lot of people are probably aware it we most lenders or bridging lenders or tell me if, if this isn't the case actually um require the borrower to put their solicitor in funds to cover um the lender's solicitor fees in the form of an undertaking um, and a lot of borrowers hear that term undertaking quite regularly, mainly when we're chasing for them to actually give the undertaking. Um, and they always want to know how the sort of fees are structured, um, how that side of the business actually works. Um, are you able to sort of expand on that just to give everyone listening a, a little bit of an idea of how the, they're calculated, um, why they might go up occasionally throughout the process and, um, and just a, a broad overview on, of that? Yeah, I mean, it, the, the, the answer to your question is that, um, you know, we work very much on on fixed fees. So, um, you know, at the beginning of a transaction, a fixed fee will be agreed. Um, the basis upon which we um, quote for that fee is often determined by um, the loan amount. Um, however, uh, you know, we will look at and take into account um the complexity of the deal and the properties involved um, often at the beginning um, in advance of, uh, you know, giving, given our, uh, our, our, our quote, um, you know, we, we do have uh, a linking to um, sort of percentages um, that we look at in order to give the deal. And that will be based on a percentage of the, um, 
the uh, the loan amount. Um, but you know, as I say, that's not always fixed in stone because you know the complexity will be something that we take into account um, as well. The the fees uh, are then fixed at say you know x thousand pounds, and we get an undertaking from the uh, the borrower's solicitor for that amount. And the reason we do that is that um, you know, with the best will in the world, sometimes the deals don't complete, um, and uh, you know, for whatever reason. And we would have committed obviously lots of. Uh, time to it um so you know we want to make sure that um we're, we're covered to that end um you know as the deal uh uh progresses um there may be things that come up um so you know let's say for example um it becomes apparent that um you know um uh, aspects of the uh funding um aside from the lenders funding um are coming from third parties so the borrower on a particular transaction is borrowing money from um, from uh, from someone else. If that's a corporate borrower, maybe it's from a director's loan, or if it's an individual borrower, maybe from its uh, you know from friends or family. And we would have to then draft and advise on you know additional documentation that we weren't aware of and didn't envisage at, you know when quoting at the beginning of the deal. Um, and therefore, we would say you know um, we try and flag this as early as possible during the transaction um you know our, our fees need to increase by x amount accordingly on top of the amount that you've given us the undertaking for at the beginning of the uh of the uh of the deal um yeah so that's an example of how and why the fees may go up um and you know there could be any number of other reasons but you know we always try and keep our fees to the amount quote at the beginning of the deal um as far as possible if yeah, you know, we have to increase them, then, uh, you know, we try and do so with as much notice as possible and make sure all parties are, um, are aware of that. Yeah, because the, the, the fees, like for the deals that we obviously do with you, 99% of the time, I would say that there is no sort of no tweaking, nothing. It, it's fairly straightforward. And I know from conversations we've had in the past, a lot of the times you will go above and beyond the actual fee that you've taken um, rather than asking for additional um, and I guess it's it once it gets to a point where it is just you know there is something there that is going to be an, a lot of work more that that's when you have to sort of step in and say look we do need to cover this um, so do you find um, with the undertaking what is the the reason for the undertaking rather than the client putting uh, either the lender directly in funds or sending the money directly to your account. Is there any particular reason for that? That's something that uh, we've been asked. Um, well, the, the reason we get an undertaking is that, you know, we we can then call on the undertaking, um, which is a strong commitment from a solicitor to a solicitor. And, you know, um, a solicitor's undertaking is something that, um, you know, uh, effectively we have recourse to go against if necessary. So we want to be certain that we're going to get, um, you know, get our fees at the end of the day. So um, it, it may sound slightly draconian, um, but, um, you know, there's no room, I don't think, for us doing work um, where there's any doubt that we're going to actually get, um, get paid for it. So it works best because, you know, we can then enforce the undertaking against the firm that's given it. Obviously, what they've done is in order to provide that undertaking, um, they've taken uh, the funds on account from their clients. Um, so, you know, that's uh, that's the traditional way of, of doing it. I mean, in the eventuality, what happens, as you'll be aware, at completion of the deal, um, we would deduct, this is what happens 99.9% .9 of the time, our actual fees from the loan amount. And then the, um, the borrower's solicitor will then account back to their client for the funds that they've held on account in order to provide the undertaking. Yeah, is, is there any reason why you don't get paid directly or either by the borrower or the lender? Well, yeah, um, well we, wouldn't, we wouldn't get, yes, well, we wouldn't, sorry, we wouldn't get paid directly by the by the borrower. The borrower is, um, uh, you know, um, advised by their solicitor and we wouldn't accept, um, you know, funds coming directly from the borrower who isn't our client into our client account. Um, you know, it needs to go from uh, solicitor to solicitor. Um, so that we can be sure that, um, you know, that solicitor who is acting for that borrower um, has carried out the usual checks um, in, in respect of money laundering and compliance, etc. So, you know, it's not for us to do that 
on behalf of someone who isn't our client. So yeah, that is why we wouldn't get, or one of the reasons why we wouldn't get funds paid to us uh, directly from uh, from the uh, from the borrower. I mean, we could and sometimes do have an arrangement where the lender will agree to pay our fees, um, but it's very rare. Um, you know, it is you know it's the traditional way and the way that works best to do it via uh, the undertakings. But um, yeah, that that's why um, yeah the borrower wouldn't pay us directly though. No, yeah, I, that's that was my assumption, especially on the the anti money laundering side of things yes, um, and the the KYC. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, in terms of um, I know you mentioned a couple of challenging deals that you've had. Is there any particular ones, sort of broad strokes, that you're you're able to share um, that have been particularly interesting um, or, or complex? Uh, yeah, well, just the, the the mind the mind boggles in terms of you know the the variety. To be honest with you, most most deals throw up um, you know one or two points which. Um, you know, are are the sticking points. Just as a general principle, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of the deal will be um, fairly standard. But um, you know, it's 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 usually the way that there's something one or two points that are uh, are sticking points. And um, you know, they may often revolve around things like um, uh, you know planning. Um, so uh, to to give you an example, um, you know, I've I've recently had a deal where um, the uh the the lender is lending um on a property which has the benefits of uh planning permission that's being granted um and you know the lender needs to be satisfied that the borrower can definitely uh implement the planning um because you know that's the value that's being attributed to the property i.e that you know the planning um, can be implemented and planning uh often comes with as you'll be aware david um pre-commencement to works conditions um, and in the particular scenario I'm thinking about here um, the 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 technical position was that uh, the borrower's planning consultant um, had applied to discharge i.e send in the information that the local planning authority required so as to deal with the particular conditions um, that the planning had attached to it and they sent in that information at point x in time um, and, uh, you know, due to sort of a technicality um, or unknown, actually, course of events or facts, the local planning authority hadn't responded. Now, um, without going into the, the details for what then happens, but there's a process and a, and a system of um, uh, analysis, if you like, whereby um, the borrower's planning consultant can then serve notice on the local planning authority um, to... Uh, um, point out to them that the uh the 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 responses should have been given earlier um and in fact because they hadn't been then um on a legal point the conditions could be what's called a deemed discharged so um you know it wasn't a case any longer that the local planning authority could say that the um the information provided was sufficient or not the local planning authority were um based on the the, the legal technicality out of time to respond um, and therefore the borrower based on the advice of their of, of their planning consultant was able to um, to claim and make a case for the conditions being uh, deemed discharged so um i've forgotten your question but um yeah that <laughs> that was a, a very recent sort of complex and technical um point that i've been looking at or have looked at um, and in the end, the process was able to be confirmed to our lender client as being, uh, you know, followed um, correctly by the uh, the particular borrower and their planning consultant. Um, and we were able to advise our lender client that although the written discharges weren't in place from the local planning authority, um, the conditions were um, able to be uh, described as deemed discharged. So, um, yeah. That's one that sticks uh, sticks to mind or comes to mind um, of a very recent sort of nature. Mm, yeah, that is an interesting one. Is that something you can sort of indemnify to cover as well, or is that sort of sufficient? Um, well, no. obviously broad strokes. Well, no, you couldn't in this instance because um, you know it was a it was a relatively recent uh, grant of planning, um, and uh, so 
the the borrower wasn't able to say that you know they didn't have to um deal with the pre-commencement conditions um at, at well, but, uh, sorry, I, I should. What, what, what I should say about that is you know, the indemnity providers won't cover something like that um, for a recent grant of planning when the planning has been implemented. Um, you know, had the planning been implemented, um, you know, uh, four plus years ago, um, and the pre-commencement conditions hadn't been satisfied, then you would say that the local planning authority was out of time. Uh, so as to take any enforcement action. But, you know, that wasn't the case. If that were to have been the case, we would advise that things were um, out of time and enforcement action, you know, couldn't be taken. We'd probably also advise that, you know, a planning of, or a lack of planning sign-off indemnity um, or lack of planning uh, indemnity, uh, you know, should or could be advised to cover any risk in any event anyway. But, um, yeah, indemnities often work, but not always. Yeah, because I know on the bridging side of things, we often get asked if we're comfortable taking indemnity policies for our own lending. Um, and when it comes to bridging, obviously, quite a lot of the time, we're, we're pretty comfortable with that um, because mainly it helps to speed things up. Um, have you noticed or has there been sort of any change recently in terms of the actual speed that bridging deals get done um, because uh, obviously historically there were lots of views taken and they were done relatively rapidly um, and I saw an article not too recently where the average bridge was sort of a month or so um, which you know in some cases it's it's faster than normal term finance but it's not exactly what you would call rapid um so how how are you guys finding that and what would any idea roughly what sort of the average is uh, from your sort of point of view so are, 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 is the suggestion that the average time for a bridge is taking longer now is that yes suggestion? yeah that that's yeah. what yeah. roughly what I mean, they, I, they were saying <laughs> i think my view on that would be um that uh you know, just as a general comment, that bridge, bridging finance is much more mainstream now um, than it was. And therefore, um, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of being used by um, people more commonly when they may have gone to, uh, you know, to a term finance deal. I think it's, uh, it's more available. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, perhaps the... Um, the time scales on average um, have have gone up. Um, I also think that you know the the uh, the case the cases and the instances of um, uh, of fraud um, and and you know um, all sorts of um, untoward uh, stuff happening have increased a lot um, over the last uh, few years as. Um, you know, people have become more sophisticated, unfortunately, in that regard. And therefore, um, you know, we uh, in advising you or lenders on on, on bridging deals, um, you know, are often involved in, uh, you know, more due diligence. And I think there's more care being taken now in respect of, um, you know, KYC, anti-money laundering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, um, you know, um, perhaps less views are taken on the underwriting aspects of a deal, um, rather perhaps on the legals of a deal, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, because I think, as you say, with the, because the bridging rates have come down, I think that has attracted more sort of... Um, yes, sort of I think better it's more clients, which, yeah. yeah, and along with that, you know you do a bit more due diligence in order to get the lower rates you've got to pass those bars and in order to check all those things it does take time so yeah it's a fine balance i think and it'd be interesting to to sort of find out actually what our average time is i'll, I'll have to look into that for another day um but time is, is running short so I'll, I'll ask one last question if that's okay um sure. and that is in terms of the, the lenders that you represent, um, when it comes to sort of advising them, is there, what sort of autonomy do you have in terms of actually saying, look, you know, this is, I, I wouldn't go past this or I wouldn't accept this. Um, 
where's that sort of fine line between the underwriting yeah. and your advice um, from the, the legal perspective? What's the sort of crossover with those two? Yeah, so I, I, I think um, the, the, the answer is that, you know, we, we'll often advise a, a lender um, that there's an issue. Um, so, for, for example, let, let's say, um, just on uh, coming back to planning, let, let, let's say that, um, you know, it's a development loan or even a bridging loan, but you want to be satisfied that, um, you know, everything's in order in terms of planning um, and, uh, you know, perhaps the sign off of um, conditions attached to a planning permission. Um, and in an ideal world, you'd say to the to the lender, you know, that, that those those um, points should be dealt with in advance of completion. Um, you know, and that would be our advice. But yeah, but you as a lender may say, well, we, we'll take a view on it. Um, you know, and the borrower can, uh, you know, perhaps deal with certain aspects, for example, those sorts of things as conditions subsequent to the loan. Um, and, you know, that I would say is an underwriting call of the vendor, a commercial decision. You know, we'll give our legal advice and, and you may say, well, we're, we're, we hear what you're saying, but we're happy to proceed irrespective of that. You know, whereas we may say to you, um, you know, for example, um, you know, it's come to light that, um, you know, there's a big red flag about uh in, in, in respect of a particular borrower, you know, they've been involved in a fraud which has come to light um, or, you know, something like a bankruptcy search has come up showing that they are actually bankrupt. And we would say to you, well, we would advise that you can't proceed um, to lend to them, therefore. And if you said that you wanted to, I think that, um, and this is this is not something that I've ever come across because I think the lender would uh, you know, usually take that point and uh, obviously, uh, you know, not proceed. Um, I think you would, as a lender, say, no, we, we, we take your advice and we, we won't proceed and we would, uh, you know, you as the lender would pull, pull the deal. If you insisted on lending to that particular borrower, I think it's likely, and again, this has never happened in my experience, we would say that, you know, we can't act for you, um, unfortunately. But uh, so there is a line. Um, but, um, you know, usually speaking, um, you know, uh, there are there are ways around stuff and, um, you know, an opportunity for commercial decisions to be made, but uh, but not always. Um, so uh, I hope that answers that particular question. When it comes to marketing for a, a solicitor firm, um, it typically isn't something that obviously is is sort of fun and energetic. And how do you actually go about sort of advertising um, your sort of firm? Because it is quite a a serious sort of job yeah um so I, i'd say that you know law, law firms traditionally um you know perhaps haven't been the best at uh, marketing and business development i mean that's my personal view you know Seddon's, however um you know is very good and we are a very proactive um and forward-looking firm so i think though you know in the first instance i think law firms um you know uh get a lot of work based on reputation and, and word of mouth. So, you know, it becomes a bit of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, however, um, I think, you know, one thing we are very good at uh, at Seddon's is um, looking at, um, you know, opportunities. So following what's happening in, in the market, um, looking on social media, you know, quite frankly, if we see a lender um, that looks like the sort of client that we would like to work with or for, um, then we'll make a sensible, um, uh, you know, approach to them and tell them a little bit about what we do and, and hopefully, um, you know, kind of go from there. I mean, obviously, at the same time, um, we have a website and we have our own social media presence and we do have a marketing and business development team that helps to drive uh, business and flow to those um, to those um, social media sites and to our website. But as I say, you know, um, I think um, we are very good at being, uh, you know, proactive as individuals, as solicitors um, and, and, and putting our name out there um, and getting in touch with people sensibly um, about what we can do and what we can offer and our expertise and speciality. Um, and luckily, though, at the same time, you know, we do get approaches to us because we have a reputation um, and word of mouth works well. Yes, it's an interesting sort of job, a bit much like um, our own lending side of things, that you don't really know what you're getting until you actually try it out. So trying to convince somebody that if you say to someone, oh, our service is really good, well, they only know what it's like when they actually start using you. Um, and and that's where the, the word of mouth, I think, obviously, historically has played a, a big part. And then obviously coming on 
places like this uh, where you can sort of spread that message and and just see you know show people that you are sort of normal down to earth you can have a chat you'll be able to easily sort of talk through things um rather than sort of overly complicating things and do you find that as that's one thing that we get a lot uh, from the borrowers that we talk to is that a lot of jargon and stuff is quite confusing um and obviously you guys are sort of there to translate it and you help us a lot on that side of things how do you find that sort of side obviously you deal with mainly lenders uh, but you find a lot of the lenders are very knowledgeable or do you have to sort of help out quite a lot as well um that's an interesting point i i, I think um the answer is to your question that yes because our clients are corporate clients i.e lenders we are dealing every day with people like yourself who have you know good technical knowledge across the board as to the sort of work that we do so you know not only are you um, you know knowledgeable in terms of uh, the commercialities the underwriting aspects but you would have come across because you're dealing with the same sort of deals as well on a daily basis the legal aspects of things but I think it's very important always to be able to stand back as a solicitor and say to yourself well you know we need to make things uh, understandable and uh, you know um, it, it package them in a way that um, uh, you know, people can understand. And it's not about um, being, uh, you know, technical for the sake of it. It's about giving advice on legal points, but in terms that, um, you know, the client can understand. And the same goes for the interaction also with the uh, the, the borrower's solicitor. Um, you know, one thing I would say, and we haven't really spoken about this, is that, you know, the borrower's solicitor is a key person in the whole, uh, the whole process of what we do. Um, Unfortunately, they're not always specialists like we are in terms of advising on uh, bridging or development or real estate finance deals. And they may be special, uh, they may be, sorry, uh, generalists or conveyances. Um, and, and that can sometimes lead to complication. But at the end of the day, if and when that's the case, it's it's down to us as far as possible to, um, you know, to make our clients requirements aware um, to them and what we're going to need from them. Obviously, it's all property law it's all law but um you know they're not always as familiar um if they're not real estate finance specialists in terms of their job they're not always as familiar with the um you know the requirements of a real estate finance deal yeah without a doubt that that is the biggest bottleneck we see um and a lot of the time and we always have the conversation it seems as though um the borrower solicitor are often uh, either afraid to ask the questions um, or assume that they can sort of make the decisions where that's not always the case um, or assume things are acceptable because they normally deal with basic high street transactions with your normal sort of Barclays, et cetera. Um, and obviously certain things work in one particular way there, but obviously with the sort of bridging, there's differences, I, I would assume, um, in terms of what is required, probably relatively similar, uh, but in the way things work. Um, so yeah, it's always good to, to make sure we get everybody on board beforehand. And I think that's one of the keys is having everybody have knowledgeable people on both sides. So yep, you're definitely <laughs> right there. Uh, do you guys do any sort of dual rep stuff at all? Or is it just um, solely for the lender and then the, the borrowers have to have their own solicitor? um we, we we do do um dual rep um yes is is the answer to that question um yeah uh the you know if someone comes to us obviously if they're buying a house and they're taking uh, finance from uh, the high street bank um from you know for example barclays then we'll act yeah on that in a conveyancing capacity um for both uh, them as the uh, buyer and for barclays as the uh, the mortgage provider um, so yes, we do. In terms of, um, I know, I know that the answer to this, but if you can let everyone know why, um, why that sort of a lot of bridging lenders aren't able to offer dual rep, or which is dual representation for for people that aren't aware, yeah. basically, where the borrower well, acts for both the, you the, and the, the lender. The answer to that question is that um, you know we're, we're governed as solicitors by the um, you know the SRA code of conduct, which has certain uh, um, you know quite rigorous uh, regulatory um, points to it. And ultimately, 
Um, it, the, the, on, on a high street uh, mortgage deal, the, the, the terms of that um, mortgage and that loan are non-negotiable. They are standard terms um, and there's no issue or concern as to any um, conflict of interest or any uh, um, such between the, the requirement of the lender and the, uh, the, uh, the borrower or the buyer of a property. However, if you're acting on a bridging deal for um, a lender such as yourself, um, you know, the, the, uh, the complexity is such and the terms are negotiable um, and they're not always standard. Um, and basically as such, um, you know, the, the code of conduct for solicitors precludes um, in general terms, um, a firm acting on a non-standard mortgage acting for both the lender and the uh, and the borrower um, on in general terms I mean there are ways around it and it does happen um, so dual rep can you know can happen on a non, non high street mortgage um, but it's not always recommended um, and we would uh, you know have to look into it very carefully to make sure that we'd um, complied with the uh, solicitor's uh, regulatory code of conduct basically before before doing that. Perfect. That, that was brilliant. Thanks, Ed. Um, just to, before we wrap up, um, would you like to let everyone listening know where they can actually find you? And I'll obviously attach any sort of details um, and your website in the comments sort of below. Um, but if you want to let everyone know, um, fire away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, as as I said at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the podcast, I work for Seddon's. Um, we're based in uh, the West End, um, Five Portman Square. Uh, I would be delighted if anyone wants to, uh, you know, email me ed. Zanima, Z N E I M E R at sedens. Um, and that's whether or not they are someone who, um, you know, is a lender or a borrower or wants advice more broadly on um, aspects of um, uh, of property or or, or um, other aspects of. Um, legal advice as as a firm if i may add we're a full service firm so you know property centric but very strong in other areas like family law private client law uh, wills trusts etc divorces um and also corporate and commercial um employment etc etc and also um we have a very strong uh, litigation team um both in terms of property litigation um, acting for lenders when unfortunately loans may go wrong or uh, more generally in in terms of um, commercial disputes um, of any nature so i just get that in as well but um, yeah be delighted to talk to anyone um, my mobile number as well 07976777984 um, or our website um, www.sedens.co.uk that is perfect and i'll have that all linked in the description so if you do want to get in touch with ed feel free um and that's that for the podcast so thank you so much for your time ed really appreciate it and obviously join us on the next one thanks a lot david pleasure all right thank you cheers